Hello, and welcome back to the Full Cast and Crew Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Silo. I'm thrilled to be joining you again today. And I'm recording a special episode all about the brilliant new Martin Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon. Just a little bit of a sound there from a film that has captured my imagination and I think is about to continue to capture the imagination of the film going public for quite some time. It's difficult. The last time I felt this way, which was the urge to record an episode rather immediately after a film's release, and this film just came out on Friday, it's now Monday, October 23rd, I'm going to release this episode this Thursday, the 26th. The last time I kind of felt so inspired and I had to get back and record something early, and what I mean by early is there's only limited clips available at the moment for the film, so I can't really illustrate a lot of the things that I think are genius and brilliant in terms of the performances and some of the filmmaking choices, but I can do some, and I will. But the last time that I came out of a movie and just felt, I've got to do this episode because i got to get this on record, really for me, selfishly, was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the Tarantino film also starring Leonardo DiCaprio. And I had a similar issue, which was, at that point, there were no clips of that film out. But I was so taken with the film in a completely different way than I was taken with this film. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I was taken by the ride, the pop cultural ride that Tarantino took me on as someone of a similar age, albeit growing up on a different coast. But I plugged into that film's aesthetic and ethic and vibe and just its its celebration of working film people and the brilliant characterizations from DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. I just wanted to be enthusiastic about that film and share it with the people that listen to this podcast because I think they're of a similar mind. And I think in this case, again, although my reaction was different because the reaction to this film was an emotional reaction. This was a film whose power is in its ability to evoke emotion in the viewer. It's reducing of a complicated, massive issue, a blot in American history to a relationship between a husband and a wife, a white man and an Osage Native American woman, and to use that relationship as the lens through which we view the real life events that took place in the Osage murders, which is the topic of David Grant's excellent 2017 book of the same name as the film. I highly recommend people read that book. Uh, I was just reminded from my friend Austin Hill that I believe Marty's next picture with Leonardo is scheduled to be David Grant's new book, which is going to be incredible and a completely different type of experience. It's an ocean-going, seafaring adventure, period piece. So I first saw the film Friday night, and I had a weird experience. Uh, It's funny. I feel the pull to almost not be honest about the first time I saw the film because I'm so now loyal to the ultimate emotional reaction that I I was left with even during that first viewing and certainly after my second viewing. But I went to the film on Friday and I went immediately again the following day to see it again. I felt like I had to because, I'm not sure, I'll tell you what happened. Before I went to the movie on Friday, I had read... Most of David Grant's book was familiar with most of the story, but not enough, it turned out. And some of the journey that the film takes you on was lost on me, but I did have an 
unfortunate text conversation with my friend Dan just prior to going when he was very good about not wanting to color my experience. But of course, me being me, I sort of goaded him into telling me his reaction to the film. And he didn't have an entirely positive experience of the film. And I don't know if that was in my mind, even though I'm an extremely independent thinking person and don't usually find myself swayed by the last thing someone told me. I'm not even sure if there is not a flaw in the film through its reliance on an attention span that maybe we just don't really have anymore. (laughs) All I can tell you is the first time I saw the film at about the two hour mark, I was not engaged with it while I, although I could admire it. But the final third of the film blew me away. And I don't think I've ever had an experience where two hours in, I'm sort of not fully engaged and wondering where it's going. But after another hour and a half, I am in awe of the film's power and can't wait to go see it entirely again in order to have the experience I had the second time I went, which is again the following day. Now, I think this may be, maybe just for me, it may be that more than a glancing familiarity with the subject and the story of the film itself is helpful. It could even be necessary. I don't know. You know, I've my wife went yesterday, but I had talked to her about the film for a couple of days and she may have picked up some information that way. And I also forwarded her a a pretty good Wikipedia page about the Osage murders and the investigation. And I told her, you know, if you read this all the way through, you're going to have a lot of information that I think is helpful to your enjoyment of the film. And it sounds like she didn't suffer from that experience that I had. So I wonder if given some of the things we'll talk about in the making of the film, being a little bit more prepped by either having read the book more recently and having more recall over what you're seeing or familiarizing yourself with this specific case and understanding that these are real people dramatized on screen, that many of the things you're seeing on the screen are directly lifted where possible from actual courtroom transcripts and law enforcement interviews. And that things such as the radio play, which ends the film actually happened. I think those are beneficial to know because for me, they were helpful. And after I knew that stuff, and I guess after I had entered the world of the film in my first viewing, and again, once that final third of the film starts rolling down these tracks, you are taken on an emotional journey that is powerful and incredible. And you realize that all along, stupid me didn't realize I was in the hands of the masters that I'm in the hands of in the making of this film. Now, when I went on Saturday and saw the film, I was even more blown away by the film because I could really appreciate how it's put together. I could really appreciate some subtleties of an astounding trilogy of acting performances at the center of this film in Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, and most particularly, Lily Gladstone, all three of whom should certainly be nominated and win Academy Awards for these roles. And a host of amazing supporting cast members who also turn in fantastic performances. So the second time... I walked out of the film thinking, wow, I've just seen a iconic American film. I've just seen Martin Scorsese's greatest film, certainly his most important film. It's his most mature storytelling. It feels like it contains his history as a film goer 
going back to when he was a kid. Something he talks about in a couple of interviews I've listened to subsequent to seeing the film twice about his penchant for Westerns as a kid. You know, Martin Scorsese grew up in Little Italy. He was asthmatic. He couldn't be around animals. He couldn't be in nature with pollen. So his experience of these things was in going to the movies and particularly seeing the Westerns of the 40s and the 50s. There are scenes in this film that pay homage to that history of American cinematic Western filmmaking. But it is also a film that can feel like the summation of an entire lifetime of mastery of craft, not only from Scorsese, but from this coterie of people who have worked with him for decades. We'll talk about that as we get into the film. So my first and general reaction to this film, my message to you is one of gratitude. Gratitude that we're living in a time when a director like Martin Scorsese is making films that we can experience. Gratitude that he has formed these creative partnerships over the years with actors like Robert De Niro and like Leonardo DiCaprio, the latter of whom is also an executive producer of this film. Not only that they've all found each other, but they're now seasoned, creative, and professional partners because that's a part of this work too. And in this episode, I want to talk a little bit about the making of the film, some of the twists and the turns thrown the production by things like COVID, and the time that that unforeseen curve thrown the production actually afforded Scorsese and DiCaprio important time to figure out their way into this source material which again was David Grant's excellent book of the same name, which gets into much greater detail, both from the history of the Osage people and the discovery of oil on their Oklahoma land and what that did to their culture. It gets into much greater detail into the, I think his name is Tom White, the Jesse Plemons FBI man character and the investigation. And it gets much more into the reporting of these, this story at the time. And so wrestling that giant book down to size proved to be difficult for the two primary, or really the three primary protagonists of the making of the film, which is Scorsese, DiCaprio, and Eric Roth, the screenwriter. So... Let's just talk a little bit about DiCaprio and Scorsese. This is the sixth feature film made by Scorsese that DiCaprio has appeared in since 2020. The films that they have worked with each other on have been nominated for 31 Academy Awards and won nine. So we're 21 years into this relationship. And as I said, all of those films and all of those experiences and many more feel like they culminate in this film, in this performance. And we'll talk more about that later in this episode when I talk further about Leo's work in this role, which is astoundingly good, like all the acting in the film. Now, the film has its origins back in 2016 when a film company won the rights to the book in an auction. Scorsese and DiCaprio became attached in 2017. It was originally supposed to be shot in early 2018, but there were many delays. And then once COVID hit in 2020, production was scheduled to finally begin in February of 2021. And then principal photography ultimately took place in Osage County, between the spring and the fall of 2021. I think it's one of the earlier films to go back into production post-COVID, or during COVID, rather. Now, one of the things that occurred was that Marty and Leo had worked on this script for a very long time, together and with Eric Roth, and they had done what was sort of in front of them, which was the, the book presented 
this story largely through the lens of the FBI investigation. And in doing so, they had framed their film as the story of the FBI agent Tom White, who is sent to Oklahoma to investigate this spate of murders taking place within the Osage community and finds himself in this incredibly complicated situation, uh, which really requires the federal government because the local government is so thoroughly either corrupted or enmeshed in what turns out to be going on as to be as to necessitate an external force to come in and help figure it out. Now, there's a great uh, podcast I've, I've mentioned a few times. It's the DGA, the Directors Guild of America podcast. And Marty was interviewed briefly by the director, Ty West, about the making of Killers of the Flower Moon. It just came out about four or five days ago. And I wanted to play you this brief moment where he discusses how he and Leonardo came to rethink their original approach to the film. Uh, we were facing the issue of how to direct him as Tom White. And we sat down after reading the script again. Um, and this is about two, three weeks before uh, the pandemic started. And he said, you know, where's the heart of the movie? And I said, the heart of the movie is her and him. It's Molly and Ernest. So he looked at me, he says, don't kill me, but I think I should play Ernest. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. <laughs> We've taken Tom White as far as we could, and I still come up against Henry Fonda and my Donald Clementine. I still come up, the, I still come up, quite honestly, with the best of Clint Eastwood. I mean, what am I doing? What are we doing? So instead of taking from the outside in, we rip the script from the inside out. And so, so we we start in the inside like soldiers. You just know, you just know one foot in front of you and to the right or left. You don't know what's going on in the battle. And so we're on the ground, and everybody you meet is suddenly, what are they doing? These people, <laughs> you don't get it. Okay, so the very close mic, Marty Scorsese, there <laughs> a little too close mic. What he's referring to is. This commitment that I've heard him also mention in another great interview he did with the director, Edgar Wright, I'm going to play a little bit of that as well, that Marty's commitment to not just doing what has been done before is impressive, probably thorny and complicated, and at times annoying for his production partners in the studios that agree to finance these films. Because what you're hearing him say there is that after many years of work because the whole production and writing of The Irishman happened while he was working on the script for Killers of the Flower Moon with Eric Roth and with Leonardo DiCaprio. And after all that work, two and a half years of time and effort to arrive at a place pretty damn close to when you start, you're supposed to start production, to realize that you've got it all wrong and you have to rethink the entire approach of the film. Well, that was a difficult proposition. In fact, it sounds like it was so difficult that the original studio, Paramount, elected to take less risk because effectively what Marty was saying to the studio was, we have this approach, except he didn't really have it because they didn't have time to have a completely finished script prior to production. And he says in the Edgar Wright conversation, they were working on the script the, up until the last day of filming in Oklahoma. So that is what typically is terrifying for studios, for actors, for filmmakers, which is we're going into production and on the first day of filming, we don't have a finished script. I would say it's probably pretty rare that great things usually follow from that process and as I said, it may be, and I don't know if you'll have this same experience seeing the film, it may be that my initial uh, feeling in the first couple of hours was because maybe this hadn't been tightened up away in the writing. Or, more likely, 
Martin Scorsese is such a masterful storyteller that he uses that first two hours of the film to really create this world for us, which has to be recreated for us because it is both familiar to us, it is part of the building block of the United States of America that we live in, but it's also foreign to us. And so he has to really create a world for us in which this story can unfold. And there's a lot of, not heavy lifting to do, but there's a lot of world building to do. And that's, I think, what the film concerns itself with over the first couple of hours. And then the last hour and a half of the film is incredibly powerful playing out of the scenarios which have been set up for us. And so... As I said, the film is an experience of, of building emotion. And um, that work that he and Leonardo did to realize, no, I shouldn't play Tom White, the FBI agent. I should play Ernest, this character who is so much more morally compromised, so much more difficult to present on screen. <laughs> He's such a worm. He's such a spineless toady. He is such a venal, self-centered, I would say emotionally manipulative, but it's almost like he's not even smart enough to be emotionally manipulative. There's a couple of scenes where he's trying to strong arm someone a little bit further down the ladder than he himself is on this criminal conspiracy, at the top of which sits his uncle, King Hale, whose mere presence informs this character's very being with whatever flimsy power he contains, by the way. Something the character seems very aware of. There's a couple of times where he's trying to strong arm criminals to do various criminal activities, and it's the desperation is what DiCaprio plays so well. He doesn't actually threaten or scare anybody because he's not threatening or scary. You know, he's not the archetypical louche killer playboy who will do nothing, uh, stop at nothing to achieve his nefarious ends. He's not like a Billy Zane on the Titanic. You know, he's this schlump. And all the more powerful is the film for this banality of evil approach, I think. And this approach that... Scorsese talks about finding in concert with DiCaprio and the work that they did to rethink the film and how it unfolds. In this conversation that I mentioned for Scorsese talking to the film director Edgar Wright about this moment, I thought it was intriguing. I tried to push through and have the story in the film um, approach the story from the point of view of what David Grant did in the book beautifully, which was from the Bureau of Investigation. They weren't called the FBI at that point. They came in from Hoover. He sent them in. And Hoover wasn't Hoover at that time. It was just beginning. Um, and uh, he had no choice because the place blew up. The house blew up. Uh, and I tried to do it. but And Leo was going to play Tom White, who was the, uh, federal, the federal agent. But I found that after two and a half years working on the script with Eric, Eric Roth and making Irishman during the same time, I found that um, I, I really, both Leo and I couldn't find a way to, 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 to see anything different or new that we could project in Tom White. This is incredible to me because this is not settling, right? Because Leonardo and Marty can make the film that Eric Roth wrote with them together where Tom White, the FBI agent, is the lens through which we explore the whole movie. They had that script. That was approved. Paramount was going to pay for that script to be made into a Martin Scorsese feature film. Okay? It's not as if they were in a pitch here where they're trying to get the film made. They had an agreement based on the script that everyone already liked, that the studio already approved. And at a late date, they're saying, actually, we're not going to do that script okay, what's the script you're going to do? Well, we don't have that yet. But what we're going to do is this. We're not going to focus on the FBI story. 
that's going to still be a part of the film, but we're going to actually recenter the film on this relationship. Sounds great, Marty, but, you know, can we see it? Well, yeah, we're working on it. And that ultimately resulted in Paramount, as I said, opting to split the risk by bringing Apple Films aboard. And Paramount, I believe, still distributes the film internationally. Now, what he's talking about there when he says, for him, the American Western ended with the Wild Bunch, what he's saying is that that's the, really the dawn of what is termed the revisionist Western, which are many quite amazing Westerns, which take a different look at American history and center and elevate other aspects of stories that weren't traditionally told in the Western. And of course, if you're a child of the 40s and the 50s, the way Marty is, you're going to have grown up on this great iconic era of the American Western, the John Ford Westerns, the um, the renowned Westerns are having a moment on the Criterion Collection right now. You know, these are the films that Marty grew up with. And and so for him, that is a Western. For him, even a neo-revisionist Western like a Howard Hawks film, such as Rio Bravo, which I recently saw this summer. Oh my God, what an incredible, brilliant, brilliant film. That's a kind of a revisionist Western before we plant that flag in the sand of Sam Peckinpah and the Wild Bunch and sort of this different look at the American West. But what he's saying when he says this in this interview is, that's all well and good to do that, but that's been done so many times. And as he says in this interview, there's an entire, I think it's a William Wyler film made of the Osage murders story uh, in the FBI story in 19, also 1959, same year Rio Bravo came out. A uh, Mervyn Leroy, sorry. This is a almost two and a half hour hagiography of the founding of the FBI starring James Stewart. And the film features these sequences where the iconic early cases that formed the basis and the reputation for what became the Federal Bureau of Investigation are presented in these vignettes, these 15, 10, 15 minute different vignettes. So you have the Ku Klux Klan, you have these, uh, this mad bomber, you have gangsters like Pretty Boy Floyd and Dillinger and you know, Ma Barker, Machine Gun Kelly, you have all these different stories. And one of those stories is the exact story that David Grant is writing about and that Scorsese is making his film about. And this is kind of a little bit of how it's presented. In County, Oklahoma. In the FBI Money story. was at the bottom of things. Money and Indians. For years, they owned small pieces of worthless land. With a little rain and patience, a good farmer could grow mud. About all. But oil was discovered and the Indians were suddenly rich. They had so much money they didn't know how to spend it. But a few salesmen showed them how. For instance, Harry Willowtree, he had three convertibles until it rained on him one day. I saw a lot of examples. Like Dan Savage Horse. He built himself a nice house, but the side yard didn't look too good. He met a plumbing salesman, and uh, Dan happened to like bathtubs. Dan's father was different. So he this is same house. what Scorsese goes into some detail in talking about with Edgar Wright, which is this infantilization of the Osage in this 1959 FBI story as you know, they're so so stupid as to be fooled by a variety of salespeople selling them useless crap that they don't need, populating this front yard with 30 bathtubs, is which, which is what we see when he's talking about this guy who's who got fell into the clutches of a plumbing salesman. 
And of course, in doing so, all this FBI story film, which contains some amazing filmmaking, Scorsese is at pains to to point out, in addition to its woefully dated approach, it, it, it's that's the lens that typically has told stories like these, right? And in doing that again, there's, what are you going to do, as he says? <laughs> so that's the cause for the recentering of the, of the film on uh, the, the married couple, Molly and Ernest at the center of the film. Now, Scorsese's working here, as I mentioned, with a number of incredibly talented, versatile, and long-serving members of his coterie of filmmakers. And they include, but are not limited to, Robbie Robertson, whose score is the final score that he worked on with Scorsese, a collaborator of his for many, many years. It's actually the 11th and final collaboration between Martin Scorsese and Robbie Robertson. Rodrigo Prito is the cinematographer who has worked on a number of Scorsese films over the years. And of course, Thelma Schoonmaker is his editor since every Martin Scorsese film since Raging Bull. 1980, she's worked on every Scorsese film. She's 83, Marty's 80. How about a shout out for people working at this level in their 80s? Okay, it's, it's pretty impressive. Now, a new member of the team who hadn't previously worked with Marty before this and someone whose work really is so intrinsically important is the production designer, Jack Fisk. Now, I was so pleasantly surprised to see his name again because we had talked about Jack Fisk when we did our episode about Carrie, the 1976 Brian De Palma film. Well, Jack Fisk at the time was married and is still, <laughs> I shouldn't say at the time, but in, in 74, he, he married Sissy Spacek. And Carrie is 19, I want to say it's 1976, I think. And so they were together on the set of this film. And he was really intrinsic to several important moments in the making of Carrie and her conception of the character. And I believe we play some of her talking about that and about his anecdotes and things that he would share with her to kind of keep her in this, this, this mind space that allowed her to create this, this brilliant and original character on screen in Carrie. Um, so Fisk was the art director for Carrie, and he's also worked either all of or the first batch of films from Terrence Malick, including Badlands, Days of Heaven, Thin Red Line, Tree of Life. Uh, but this is the first time he's worked with Scorsese. And Jack Fisk is known within Hollywood for being the type of production designer you go to if you want to build sets on location. So in other words, I gather that in the world of production designers, you may have production designers whose expertise lies in the world of CGI filmmaking, for example. You may have production designers whose expertise lies in shooting at a studio. And you have a production designer like Jack Fisk who specializes in location scenery and in building location scenery. And I think that the locations of Killers of the Flower Moon lend it such a sense of place. It is brilliantly evocative, the locations. They feel truthful. And in reading about Fisk's approach, it makes, you sound, it, makes it sound like this is the, one of the coolest jobs you could possibly have because it's a investigative job. He's got to go back and figure out what did things look like at this time 
where would Molly have lived? Physically, like literally, what's the address? What type of house or apartment or home would she have lived in? What, would the, what was on these streets in this location at this time? And let alone all of the uh, different consultation that the filmmakers did with representatives of the Osage Nation to make sure that all of the cultural representation of the Osage way of life was presented as authentically as it possibly could have been. That's a whole other aspect of the film that I'll talk about in a second. But in terms of the production design and for Jack, Jack Fisk, who's been nominated a couple of times, he was nominated for There Will Be Blood, the Paul Thomas Anderson film, 2007. And he was nominated uh, for The Revenant in 2015, another Leo DiCaprio film. But I can't imagine that he doesn't win for this. Um, but again, I'm emotionally reacting to the fact that I think everybody should win for this. I think it should win Best Actor. It should win Best Supporting Actor. It should win Best Actress. It should win Best Director. It should win Best Film. It should win Best Cinematography. It should win Best Editing. It should definitely win for Best Score. And it should win for Best Adapted Screenplay. Have I left anything out? Cinematography? All of it. I just can't imagine there's a better film that's going to come out in 2023. So here's an interesting quote I wanted to read. Is a, a writer named Jim Hemphill wrote in IndieWire about Jack Fisk's production design. He said, quote, The tragedy of Killers of the Flower Moon lies partly in its depiction of the loss of the Osage way of life. It's a story told as much through Fisk's designs as through the script. The juxtaposition of Osage traditions with the encroaching, largely corrupt world represented by Ernest and his uncle, William King Hale, that's De Niro's character. This juxtaposition permeates the entire film and benefits from the rigorous research by Fisk, Scorsese, and Scorsese's archivist and co-producer, Marianne Bauer. The result is, per Fisk's intentions, a movie so rich in detail that it marries the qualities of a documentary with the emotional satisfactions of a great piece of narrative filmmaking. Sorry, I'll have to pause as a squadron of fighter jets passes overhead here in New York City. Wow, that's not jarring or disconcerting at all, is it? As we head towards World War III, Another great article about Fisk's production design. I'm going to put links to both of these articles in the podcast notes. I don't know, I don't know if this is a Dutch magazine. It's called Design. There's an article by Kajsa Carlson, which just came out, which is about Fisk's production design. And this is the article that I read. I just thought, like, this is the coolest job you could possibly have. Um. Fisk says, quote, I started investigating. I went back to some of the first treaties around 1808 and 1825. I saw how the Osage were taken advantage of by our government to move them around to open land for European settlers. I wanted to figure out where Molly lived in 1920. Nobody knew. There was no record. But then I started going through the county records, and by the time the film started shooting, I'd found four of her houses. I was able to lay out the whole town, every building, for different years and how they evolved. I started to try and integrate as much of the information I learned about the community into these two blocks of decrepit buildings in Paul Huska, Oklahoma, that we could use for our town. He built a train station with 1,600 feet of track. There's a big train station scene. One of the great sets is this uh, pool hall and barber shop, <laughs> which is such a great touch because it allows for two different types of scenes to take place in one location. And it looks out onto the street of the community. Fisk said, quote, I remembered as a kid getting my hair cut in the pool hall in a little town in the Midwest. I said to Marty that we could combine the pool hall and the barbershop. He loved that idea. It became a really interesting set. All of the people in there planning to get the Osage money looked out the window to see the Osage world going by. They knew who had money and who had lost it. It was a great place for them to conspire. 
This is the type of stuff that's going into the production design. Fisk says, quote, it's an investigation, but it's exciting. You feel sort of like a detective and you can't really design things until you get the knowledge of the research. And this all is stuff that you don't have to do technically, right? You get to do this if you're of the mindset that someone like a Scorsese is. And you've heard me mention the word too many times on the podcast, verisimilitude. I'm of the belief, I don't know why, but that the closer to a truthful story, a film about that story lies, the more powerful the film has a chance of being. Not to say that you don't sometimes need to cut corners or combine story elements, but for example, there are sequences in this film which after the fact I learned were taken verbatim from court transcripts and interviews with the people involved. Notably, there is the testimony of the guy who kills Molly's sister. And he, there's this extremely matter-of-fact recounting of this brutal murder. And... When you see it in the film, it, it has a feel of something. You're not sure what it is. Well, it turns out that what it is is authenticity, verisimilitude. This exchange between John Lithgow playing the lawyer who is examining Kelsey Morrison, played by Louis Canselmi, great, great actor, uh, this is an exact verbatim transcript from the trial of how Kelsey Morrison recounted killing um, Anna, who is Molly's sister, shooting her in the top of the head. And it, it's that's an that's the greatest example I can give you of why I think verisimilitude lends something you can't get through mere fictional scripting. It's because that's real that it has such a weird power. It's truthful, but it's also theatrical. It's gothic almost. And there are many examples of that in this film. It turns out there's another one where the same character is talking with a lawyer because his wife has died and his wife had, well, they're, what they're doing is they're sending a little background of this character. This is when the FBI is investigating. And they're talking about Kelsey Morrison. They're like, yeah, you know, his, his wife mysteriously died. And she had two children that weren't his. And he's visiting a lawyer and he's asking the lawyer, now, if my wife died, if I were to adopt these two children and they were to die, would I inherit their oil rights? And the lawyer says, well, that sounds like you're talking to me about adopting these children and then killing them. And Kelsey Morrison character says, well, not if it's not legal. Like that's all, le that's legitimately what they said to each other, which came out in the investigation and the prosecution of these crimes and of, of Kelsey Morrison himself. So again, these are scenes in the film that actually happened. And to me, to know that, I found really helpful, certainly by the time I saw the film the second time. Similarly, I found it helpful to know that the radio play, which ends the film, which I haven't heard people find it completely jarring, but I have heard a few people be a little bit off put by it. Um, feel like it's a strong kind of a choice. And of course, Scorsese himself appears at the end of that sequence. Now, that was an actual radio play that occurred. And Scorsese talks in this interview with Edgar Wright about how his original idea for the ending was to show the behind the scenes filming of that FBI story sequence about the Osage murders starring Jimmy Stewart, that he was going to show that being filmed and that was going to be this mechanism, which to me, using that or using what they did in the radio play 
is a way of brilliantly, to me, both summing up without having to do those things on screen where it's like, so-and-so was scheduled to life in prison, but was pardoned and died in a trailer park and Molly got remarried and lived with her second husband, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's a way to do that, that they found again, this idea, let's not just do what everybody always does. How can we do this differently? And I think in addition to doing it differently, I haven't heard Marty talk about this. So this could be just what I am putting onto things, but what I think that is also doing is it's commenting on our moment, our true crime moment, right? True crime podcasts stating versions of things that become the way people think about very complicated stories simply by dint of becoming the most recent way that story was told. Look at Serial as a podcast, right? We all listen to that. Well, however many years on we are, it's a little bit more complicated. In fact, it's a lot more complicated. And the way you were presented that story left everyone, including the two people making that true crime podcast, thoroughly convinced of this guy's innocence, thoroughly convinced that there's a miscarriage of justice. And in fact, maybe there has been, we don't know, but certainly subsequent to that, there have been a lot of things that have occurred legally which would give you pause and makes you realize that that is a essentially fictionalized version of events presented in even more damagingly a documentary-esque feeling production. But is it the truth? It's not. It's not the truth any more than Scorsese's film version of David Grant's book version of this story is the truth in quotes. But what it is, that radio play moment at the end for me, is I think it comments on this moment that we live in, this true crime moment. But I think it also acknowledges that as human beings, we can tend to trivialize these incredibly difficult and important moments in our history by turning them into entertainments, however moving and profound they might be. Killers of the Flower Moon is a big budget Hollywood filmed entertainment. It is provocative. It is shining a light on a particularly dark corner of American history. And it tells us many important things about ourselves today, just as it tells us the story, its story of what happened then. But what it also does is, I believe, it, Marty implicates himself by putting himself in that to read the final button about Molly. To me, that feels like an, like an acknowledgement that he could have avoided putting himself on screen in that moment and remained a bit kind of, you know, brushing his hands of responsibility, even though he's the director. I think it feels to me like he is saying... Even I am part of this obfuscation, this storytelling, this turning these moments into entertainments. That's what it feels like to me. I don't know if he really had that intention. Maybe that will be something that comes out as he continues to talk about the making of this film. I want to talk a little bit about the incredible score before we get to some of the performances that I'd like to talk about. As I mentioned, it was the 11th and final collaboration between Robbie Robertson, the great musician, songwriter, member of the band, a guy who, like the way that Scorsese's filmic knowledge goes back to the entire history of filmmaking around the world, and he grew up fundamentally attending films in the 40s and the 50s, going to the movie theaters. In the same way, Robbie Robertson grew up in American popular music, country Western music. Even though, even as a Canadian, his experience on the ground in important bands, the band, playing with Bob Dylan, uh, 
playing with Ronnie Hawkins and the Nighthawks, being present for so much essential, foundational, pop cultural, musical history, literally on stage, makes him, too, someone who, still at it, uh, at the end of his life, what turned out to be the end of his life, turned in just an incredible film score that is so... You couldn't think of anyone but Robbie Robertson maybe to do this. He's spoken many, many times of his own Native American background and roots. And he brings that to to this score. And he spoke with a variety reporter in the summer, Chris Willman. I'll put a link to this as well. Uh, He spoke to Chris Willman at the end of July and... Two weeks later, he di- he died on August 6th. Um, and certainly Robinson in this interview is not talking as if he's aware that he's going to die in two weeks. So it's kind of poignant. Um, but he has some great quotes in this thing about working with Scorsese as often as he did. He says, quote, I mean, we're in awe ourselves that our brotherhood has outlasted everything. You know, we've been there. We've been through it. We've been there and back. Our story is a trip. I'm so proud of our friendship and our work. It's just been a gift in life. And at the same time, I didn't have to just do what he does. I get to do what I do with other people too. So yeah, I'm unbelievably grateful for this opportunity. He says, quote, and now Marty and I are both 80 years old and we're getting to do a Western. He says something I thought was such a great quote. Whenever you're going to do a project, you want to shoot high and you want to do some really good work. But on something like this, where its soul is from Indian country, for me, it comes down to, you couldn't have written this. You couldn't have made something like this up. This is so magical. And the writer says, quote, what Robinson is alluding to there, the serendipitous, almost too good to be true part is the fact that his mother was Native American, and that he has long and proudly embraced that as part of his heritage. His mother would frequently take him to the Six Nations Indian Reserve as he was growing up. And he had occasion to visit reservations most recently, He says he spent time in Oklahoma with the Osage people Um, in some of the final weeks that Scorsese was shooting the film, absorbing moods and ideas for his eventual score. And he said of composing this music, obviously for me, it starts at the very beginning. When music comes along in my life, when that button gets pushed, it says, this is a direction you're going to go in. You gather pictures in your head of this music at Six Nations, being played while I'm sitting there, and my relatives are all sitting around with their instruments, and they're singing, and they're breathing. One guy would start a rhythm, and somebody would start singing a melody to that, and it was just haunting, and I thought, whoa, this is what you do on the reservation? Because I was living between Toronto and the Six Nations Indian Reserve, so I'm just learning all the thousands of things that they do there that they don't do in the city, and the feeling of the music beside you like that, humming, droning, the groove of the feel of it. All of that getting under your skin, it goes to that place and it lives there forever. That's what we found out. It's still there and it didn't move. You can move, but it don't. And all of this is what he brought to composing this incredible music that is used throughout this film. You know, I recently rewatched, I was on a long plane flight back from a, a, a work conference in Europe and I took the occasion to rewatch Blade Runner 2049 because I have plans to do that on a forthcoming episode of the podcast. And two, that's a very long film. And it requires a focused, seated attention like Killers of the Flower Moon. And continually, whenever I watch that film, and I've seen it probably 10, 12 times now, so it's seven times in the theater itself. It's the music in Blade Runner 2049 that's so phenomenally astounding to me, my memory of seeing and hearing that in the cinema, it's indelibly imprinted upon my mind. And here too, the music is something I will never forget because these cues, and in particularly this heartbeat theme, is so simply haunting.
this is used particularly in the last third of the film as the investigation hurdles towards this inevitable feeling gothic conclusion this heartbeat is just kind of omnipresent through so many scenes sometimes without this background instrumentation it's incredibly effective I mean this is Robbie Robertson This is the perfect person at the perfect place at the perfect time to do something indelible that will forever be a part of how this film is experienced and understood. There's an extraordinary sequence in the beginning of the film, which Scorsese references as a bit of an homage to the less um, politically correct version of Native Americans that were put on screen in those films he's talking about growing up watching in the 40s and the 50s. He says, you know, there's always a scene where the Indians are dancing around as oil spurts around from them. And he, he re recreates that in this film. But it has this, this music from Robbie Robertson underneath that sequence, right at the beginning of the film. Impulsive rhythmic backbeat, you you have layered on top of that these slinky, jaunty rock and roll R and B vibe feeling elements. It, it lends things sort of a uh, a slinky sensuality, but also kind of a, a a bit of a a bit of a hint of impending doom, I believe. of two contrary forces. You have the historical background of the Osage people represented here by that flute sound. Then you have the reality of commerce and as one of the Osage characters says in the film, the white man's money, which comes to impinge upon their culture. This is what this music represents. It's how it's used in these scenes that's so incredible. There's an amazing scene that takes place between De Niro and DiCaprio on the porch of Molly's house, which is one of the great uses of the soundtrack. And I'll, I'll, I'll think if I, if I, did I save the, the clip here? Yeah, it's, so in this clip, one of Molly's sisters has died because of the wasting disease that the Osage believe is taking so many lives. But of course, they're being poisoned slowly by their white husbands, in part as a result of this scheme concocted by King Hale, played by De Niro. And the scheme that Hale is really overseeing is within his own uh, family and in the Molly's family, one of whom is married to a character who's played by the musician Jason Isbell. And after she dies, uh, there's this extraordinary sequence where the Jason Isbell character asks uh, Ernest, played by DiCaprio, to leave. And it's one of these great acting moments that DiCaprio has because both he and we don't know why he's being asked to leave by Bill Smith. And it, it's such an extraordinary scene how he has this moment of confusion. And we have a moment of confusion. I love that we're in this moment together with this character. It's a kind of a sneakily brilliant way to foster this sense of understanding that I think 
Scorsese is lulling us into with DiCaprio? Is he using our general warm feelings towards an actor of his stature eventually against us? He talks in these interviews about the complicity that people become complicit in these schemes to defraud the Osage, to murder the Osage. And in becoming complicit, there are the roots of the genocide. In a way, he's doing the same thing with our sensibilities as filmgoers, because on the big screen, there's Robert De Niro, there's Leonardo DiCaprio. Your sympathies may naturally lie with those people because of the history that you have of watching them in films for decades and decades and decades. In this moment played uh, at the house after the funeral where Bill Smith is the Jason Isbell character asks Ernest to leave the home. Again, we are with Ernest because we don't know what's happening. And then outside King Hale played by De Niro explains things to Ernest in no uncertain terms. And listen for the score that's used underneath this bit. It shows itself to you that Bill Smith didn't take the proper care of Minnie the way he could have. To have her sick and die, take her head rights and her land. That oil which should go to her sister as your wife. Well, he's taking money that by rights should go to Molly. My mother, Lizzie. Not a good shape. She won't last. Most Osages don't live past 50. Were these women dying with how Osage suffered from illness? You have to make it the head rats come to you. You see? This is such an extraordinary scene between two extraordinary actors. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But again, you hear the use of, of Robbie Robertson's incredible music. There's also an incredibly scored sequence where they stop down on the Tulsa massacre, which is briefly touched upon in the film as another obvious black mark in American history. This music is terrible and filled with terror and the horror of those events. composition of instrumentation and the way he's layering it on top of things here is so powerful and it's such a presence throughout the entire film it's almost another character in the film it's almost another directorial vision throughout the film the way this music is used in concert with the production design the the cinematography the costumes are phenomenal unbelievable all across and this is part of what's working in terms of the genius of the, the craft of filmmaking. And another thing I wanted to speak about in terms of the film, which is an important aspect of the making of the film, is the involvement of Osage people and Native people in the pre-production, the research, the filming, the making of the film, because there are a lot of people behind the scenes who contributed to many of the aspects of the culture which we see so carefully depicted on screen. Well, as I said, when I, when I, um, I, I felt that when I first read, when I looked, we even took the book, I said, if you're going to be dealing with the indigenous people, I said, we're going to have to know them. We simply have to know them. And so what that means is they have to be uh, with us. You know, and it, it's got to be different from the way other films were made about them or about their world. And so automatically, uh, once the script was in progress, we uh, sent a group of people to meet 
um, chief standing bear. And then I was brought out to meet them just before the COVID, uh, the COVID epidemic. And so um, uh, once meeting them, I understood that we have to be, I understood even more that we have to be extremely careful and not uh, stuffy, not uh, pr prissy with everything that has to be lived in and felt. And so um, in learning about how a blanket is worn uh, and what the designs of a blanket mean, uh, we learn who the people are and we get to know each other. And I, it really was interesting. It really was. And it's, it's, it's something that's always fascinated me about American uh, indigenous people and, and, and First Nations. And so I was, you know, fascinated by it. Um, and I tried to get as much as I could into uh, what, what they put into the film. They also, as you know, uh, so many of the Osage uh, not only uh, uh, were in front of the camera, but also behind the camera, uh, making... Uh, uh, designing and helping making the uh, costumes and all the uh, all the props that because a lot of this had been forgotten even the language has been forgotten there's only uh, Van Bighorse and uh, Chris uh, Chris who's the other guy he, he he taught the actors how to speak Osage including uh, Leo and De Niro and so <laughs> yeah, they were learning their language again and the young people are coming back you see for their rituals now and the young people are beginning to the young Osage are coming back and uh, uh, understanding now the value of who they are and what their nation was and still is, you know. And so this is something that happened, a kind of a rebirth in a way, we hope. And I think that some of the scenes that Scorsese stages where the culture of the Osage is front and center are, are quite remarkable. They're very carefully done. You can feel the care and the attention. And they also, again, going back to that point that we've heard Marty reference a couple of times, the desire to just not do what has already been done, particularly when it comes to Hollywood's history of depiction of Native peoples in general, Native Americans in specific, in their films of the past. Plenty of well-meaning directors have inadvertently put their foot in it by resorting to the types of magical stereotypes and gee whiz characterizations which actually dehumanize the very people they're purporting to put front and center in the film now of course in this center it's going to be an inescapable topic of conversation and i referenced this a bit in the intro and i'll mention it again when we talk about some of the performances but you're going to eventually inevitably have this conflict between well, it's a white director and centered in the story is a white experience. And Leonardo DiCaprio is a huge movie star and his experience is the lens through which we view the events. And as such, you know, the film should come in for criticism as a result. There was a language consultant Christopher Cody, who gave his take on seeing the film for the first time. I was nervous about the release of the film. Now that I've seen it, uh, I have some strong opinions. As, as an Osage, I really wanted this to be from the perspective of Molly and what her family experienced. But I think it would take an Osage to do that. Um, Martin Scorsese not being Osage, I think he did a great job representing our people. But this story is being told, this history is being told almost from, from the perspective of um, Ernest Burkhart. And they kind of give him this conscience and they kind of depict that there's love. But when somebody conspires to murder your entire family, uh, that's not love. That's not love. That's, that's, just beyond, that's just beyond abuse. Now, I, I think that's an entirely valid and fascinating point that the film will cause you to wrestle with. You know, personally, I think that Ernest is such a, he's such a buffoonish. Yes. He can, he is complicit in horrific evil, but to me, there is Molly at the center of the film, because I think that Lily Gladstone's performance creates that center. She's the moral center of the film. Ernest's behavior 
is what we follow the story through. So I guess in that sense, I do see what he's talking about that, you know, the story is told through this lens, but I, I still fail to see where Ernest is given any redemptive arc whatsoever. You know, his last act is a terrible act. He has not changed. Uh, again, I don't think you can handle this any particular way to avoid criticism from any uh, from any camp. It had had Scorsese centered the Osage stories more than he did, he would of course be criticized for doing that as a white man. And what right does he have to tell these stories? You know, I think. Those voices are all going to be important and people will have a variety of fascinating takes. I mean, any movie that gets people talking about these things is a good thing. And when it's stirred up because a film is provocative or affords us the opportunity to talk about, well, who should tell stories versus who gets to tell stories? What is the role and the responsibility of the filmmaker in Martin Scorsese's uh, position does he have a responsibility beyond that which he apparently hearing from many Osage people who were involved in the making of the film he took very seriously to make sure the culture was depicted appropriately that it was depicted accurately and then again that it wasn't stylized in this Hollywood kind of bullshit manner and when you read about the making of the film and the way in which the production went to people like the Osage Nation. Chief Jim Gray has been on CNN and other places talking about, you know, that how they influenced uh, the film and Scorsese meeting with the chief of the Osage Nation, uh, Jeffrey Standing Bear, and the resources that the tribe provided the film, language assistance, uh, research assistance in terms of clothing and ritual and all of these uh, things, all the way including uh, apparently um, Jim Gray himself is the great grandson of Henry Roan, a character you will meet in the film whose killing is one of the saddest of the many depicted in the film. So he was, you know, this is still not so far long ago that he, he's not interacting with direct descendants of people depicted on screen. And of course, from Scorsese's perspective, he would say that, as you heard him say, you know, he realized that he was, as he said, looking from the outside in, which concerned him. And that's why they decided to focus the film on the relationship between Molly and Ernest and that that sort of, in Scorsese's eyes, brings the story from the inside out. Whether it does or not, I guess that's the topic of consultation here. And to Christopher Cody's point, it would take an Osage director to tell an Osage story in a specific way that maybe there's an opportunity now to have those stories told. There are currently a number of representative TV series and movies that are bringing Native American lives to the screen in, in different and intriguing ways. And if we're living in an era where that's possible, uh, perhaps the success of a film like this creates more opportunity for different people to chime in and tell their part of these stories. And I guess only through multiple people doing that can we get something approaching a cumulative understanding. Now, some of the interesting ways in which the community is represented is certainly in the language. You hear De Niro speaking it. You hear DiCaprio speaking it. A lot of the um, native actors are speaking the language. And um, one of the more interesting articles that I found was in Vogue, of all places, primary source for me, researching any film, of course. And that was where the uh, lead costume designer, Jacqueline West, was talking about the research process before filming. And she knew that she needed consultants coming from uh, the Osage Nation. And so this Vogue article talks about how they assembled a team of artists to work on costume pieces for the film and to make sure, again, there's a lot of this kind of uh, research that uh, goes into 
figuring out uh, what people wore, how did they wear things, uh, the blankets that they're wearing, where did they come from, what were the color schemes, because a lot of the photographs, of course, that they had a ton of photographs, but they're all in black and white. And so they wanted to go one step further. So Pendleton blankets are what a lot of the Osage uh, female characters are wearing. So they went to Pendleton and they found uh, what colors Pendleton was producing in the 20s for the Osage. And that through that, they could figure out how to accurately depict the colors that they would be wearing. How are they wearing the blankets? Um, the jewelry right down to things that aren't explained. One of the things I love, like I love a detail that somehow you know is naturalistic and correct, even though it's not explained. When Molly and Ernest get married, there are these or adorned top hats and these, and, and these military costumes that the women are wearing. And you're kind of wondering, where does that come from? You just sort of get the feeling that... Um, that there's something correct about it. And it turns out that, of course, in Vogue, I learned the truth, uh, which it says, quote, Ernest and Molly's wedding ensembles were crucial costumes. In Osage culture, traditional wedding coats and top hats worn by women during the ceremony are some of the most important and sacred elements. The look derives from the early 1900s, when military jackets and top hats were often given to Osage chiefs and leaders from the U.S. government and were subsequently repurposed as bridal attire, says lead costume designer uh, Jacqueline West. Quote, the irony is that it takes something that represents the white man's power and makes it something joyous and celebratory for an Osage wedding. There's something so beautifully rebellious about that. And you can see Molly wearing this top hat, this military costume with the epaulettes and all of these things. And this all comes from the work that was that goes in behind the scenes. I mean, again, you know, can you not do this? Yes. Do most films probably not do this? Yes. Is the film better for having done this? I believe that it is. And one of the more interesting aspects of this is that the film may actually have a role to play in ongoing legal disputes regarding the returning of land and head rights to the Osage people. And again, we think these things, oh, this, this took place in the 1920s. Well, it's still going on. And part of the additionally interesting research that I uncovered was a, a deadline article by Valerie Complex that sets out all of the kind of particulars of the legalities of what was going on here. And a quote from the article, she writes, quote, many Osage sold the land, but due to a smartly negotiated agreement overseen by Osage Principal Chief James Bigheart and a half-nated lawyer named John Palmer, the nation negotiated a deal with the U.S. government wherein every full-blood Osage retained their head rights on any mineral and oil deposits within the reservation. What's more, those head rights, which afforded quarterly distributions from the Osage mineral estate, could not be sold, only passed down through family. Now, of course, what's the, the ironic and tragic consequence of that well-intentioned decision, which is let's not have these be able to be sold. They can only be passed down. Well, as the article indicates, shortly thereafter, numerous tribe members began turning up dead because that's the only way to have the head rights revert to the white spouses who became the new recipients of the distributions. And so the land... Um, is it can still be at issue here. And I believe they are still attempting to sort out the fact that some 26% of these rights are not held by the Osage people. Um, it sounds like, it says here in the article, non-members hold 26% of head right interest in the Osage mineral estate. And they're pushing legislation where non-Osage can gift or sell their interests back to the nation. You'd think they'd be able to do that, but for, for existing legal constraints, quote unquote, non-Osages have been resorting to a federal tiered system for transferring these interests for over 20 years due to the barriers federal law has created for those who may want to return those rights. Why there would be barriers, I have no idea. Um... 
it sounds like for some reason the government doesn't want to probably give people some financial benefit for returning either imp- like maybe you can't legalize the return of improperly gained assets could be one thing. I'm just speculating off the top of my head here, which I shouldn't do, but, or is it that, um, moneyed interest that hold this 26% really don't want to give it back. And they therefore created a complicated set of quote, existing legal constraints to make it almost impossible to just give back something which they should or shouldn't have. I guess it's a thorny issue, which remains unresolved and will continue to unfold. Perhaps the movie itself will shine some light on those types of things. One of the aspects of the film that I appreciated was that there are also a few scenes where Osage members are speaking incredibly clearly about what has befallen them. These are Stahe are murdering us. In the case of Anna Brown, her family here on the west side have raised funds of the amount of about $2,000 to $5,000 for the arrest and conviction of the murderer. Molly Burkhart has hired a private investigator. Uh huh. When this money started coming, we should have known it came with something else because it's white man's money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not what we were taught coming down Missouri. Mm Arkansas and Kansas. What has come to our reservation that doesn't belong here, and it's them. Mm -hmm. They're like buzzards circling our people. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to pick us body clean, Mm -hmm. leave nothing. You know, that scene is incredible because it's played where De Niro and DiCaprio's characters are in this meeting and they're hearing this extremely pointed commentary, which basically says these buzzards have come in to our community and are picking our bones clean. Again, it's part of what I think is impressive about the film, which is the the, the native people are not presented as these guileless, uh, easily duped people who have no agency or sense of what actually is happening. It has a much more naturalistic, realistic view of power and how it's exerted, which is that you can have something happening to you and know that it's happening, but still be powerless within the system you find yourself in to stop it from happening. And I think that's a more nuanced portrayal, if not the most quote unquote complete portrayal. So, that's a little bit about the the craft with which this film is assembled is at the very highest level. And I believe that when all is said and done, much like I believe this about Blade Runner 2049, I think these two films, Blade Runner 2049 and Killers of the Flower Moon, will come to represent in this specific time that we're living in some of the highest achievements in the art of making cinema that will have existed from this time. They are two of the greatest films ever made. They do very, very different things. But one thing they share in common is they tell us about ourselves through circumstances ostensibly not at all related to our everyday lives today. One in the science fiction, noir detective realm, the other in this historical biopic genre. And that to me is a part of all of the craft that goes into the making of these films. All right, let's talk about the cast. We're going to start with the principles here. De Niro, for me, this is the most I have ever seen De Niro disappear into a role. I don't mean that he has not always perfectly embodied all of the iconic roles that he has played over his 50-year career, but... This is a a role unlike any he's ever played before. 
And it is, it requires something so different of him. What is present is this sense of canny, cunning, evil, scheming intelligence and manipulation that is behind every single word this character speaks and every single action this character takes, right down to the most minute physical movements that he makes when, inter- when interacting with the other characters. I'm talking about the way his eyes cut away from someone, the way his eyes steal a glance at someone to see if the thing he just said has landed its mark. It's not a showy, loud De Niro performance. Like I said, I don't think he's ever played this type of character before, and he is absolutely incredible in it. He is always manipulating. His his every moment in the film is a performance for other people in the film. Again, this is where if we had more clips, I would play them, but just some of them that come to mind when I think of De Niro's performance in this film are some of his initial conversations with Ernest as Ernest arrives in the area after the war, his um, manipulation of Ernest is so subtle and yet so obvious at the same time. But when he finally turns himself in, he does it in this grand showy manner. Hey, I, I heard I'm wanted. Well, what for, King? Apparently murder. You know, he's making light of this thing that he's actually done. And he is the pulsating heart of evil at the center of the film. You know, this scheme, which is just, by the way, one of many which transpired in this community. uh, But you can trace this evil directly to his efforts here to scheme to obtain the oil rights passed down to the surviving family members of the Osages that have the misfortune of falling into this web that he has spun around all of these characters. And his avuncular presence is such a great vehicle for uh, truly what I think is one of, what I think is De Niro's greatest acting performance. You know, it, it, again, it's not, it's not Travis Bickle. It's not iconic in that sense. Um, it's not Jimmy Conway. It doesn't have the fun of something like that. But man, in terms of using your art and your instrument for the furtherance of the greater good of understanding, he is an impressive vessel in this regard in this film. And every time he's on screen, it is a pleasure to watch the masterclass that's being presented of physical acting. And his match in physical acting in this film is Leonardo DiCaprio, who yet again is approaching in his mid forties, showing us that he's only getting better. He's only getting more capable of delivering complicated, emotionally grounded performances of a sort that if you followed this guy purely in the gossip pages, you'd be forgiven for wondering how the hell he ever figures out how to touch the realness of the emotional stuff that he's got to do in a film like this. It's it's unreal. You know, he, he's not married. He doesn't have children. He's He's on yachts. He's with models who are 24 years old. He's in nightclubs. Like, this life that he appears to live has to be at odds with something that we don't get to see that allows him to do the things he does in a film like this. For him as well as De Niro, it's his greatest acting performance to date. And what's different about it is too, this performance is so physical in his use of his face. He has this scowl. He knits his brow. He has these this, these teeth that are obviously you know, a denture that he's wearing. It juts his jaw out. It's incredible. He, he can scrunch his face up in such a way that you, you read and feel so many of the layers of what's going on in this 
otherwise pretty inarticulate, stupid character, you know, who really doesn't have the ability to explain himself to anyone, especially when his life is on the line. But my God, does Leo play these scenes with a precision and an exactitude that is incredible. And again, this is why this is a film I think you're going to be able to watch, or certainly I'm going to be able to watch numerous times in a movie theater, because a movie theater is the best place to experience this film while you can. I believe Apple has a new strategy for releasing films in cinemas. It's not going to just be there for a week or 10 days. I believe they're releasing it for at least 45 days, which is which is great. Because that means that like Blade Runner 2049, another film that rewarded repeat viewing, I can go see this film another four or five times in a theater. And I plan to, because you're not going to see something like this too often. You're not going to see a coming together of elements like this very often. And I want to be able to go and sit there and marvel at this craft executed to this standard. Um, he is simply incredible. The, the final scene that he has with Molly, where she has sat in court after various obfuscations by him, he finally is telling what we know to be the truth of his complicity and involvement in the schemes which have led to the death of all of her three sisters, Henry, other, other Osage characters we've come to appreciate and love. He's been involved in all of this nefariousness. She's heard all of that sitting in court. And the cutaways are brilliant, by the way. And when we talk about Lily Gladstone in a minute, we're going to have a lot to say about that. But there's this amazing final scene where she and Ernest have a moment together after his testimony. And she asks him, have you told the truth? And he says, yes. And then she asks him something that she kind of knows already. And I think you see this throughout their scenes together. She has diabetes. These crooked doctors in town have given him these boxes of insulin, which are making her sick. They're not making her better. And then they give, her, they give him a vial of some type of, I believe it's heroin. And he's, he begins spiking her shots and turning her into this opiate addicted junkie whose life saps away from her in this extraordinary sequence when she takes to her bed in their home. And she asks him in this court setting, what, would, what did you give me? When you watch this again, because I'm assuming you've already watched it if you're listening to this, look at his face. Look what he does with his face in answer to that question. It's extraordinary. And it is, it's, it's heart wrenching, it's heartbreaking, and you can't believe it. He can't admit to her what he's done. And I think this is a scene people are going to discuss because I've already read a few interpretations of it. Um, I was texting with a friend today who saw the movie yesterday and uh, he had sort of at first told me that he thought that, you know, Ernest was the heart of the film and we sort of had seen him transform over the course of the film and that's how he experienced it. And I sort of pushed back and said, well, I don't think he transformed at all. I mean, he's, he ends his presence in the movie with a lie and he arrived in the film with uh, with lies. So I don't see that he's he's certainly been affected by the events because we've seen him be affected by the events. We've seen him fall to the ground in his jail cell in another incredible piece of acting by DiCaprio. We've seen him have to face this woman he does love and admit to the terrible things he's been a part of doing to her family. But I don't think he's grown. And people have said, what's going on in that scene? Is she willfully accepting him at his word and doesn't really want to know what he was giving her? Because we don't see her after she asks the question. She asks the question, he answers. I believe there's one quick cutaway 
to her, but there may not even be. The sound that we hear of her departing the scene is the door closing as she leaves the room. And you're left looking at Ernest's face and his awareness of his lie. It is a phenomenally acted, edited, directed scene. And it is entirely up to these two actors. Now, my friend's interpretation was that he saw that lie as Ernest trying to hold on to the one thing that actually means something to him, which is her and his love for her. He does love her. He does love his kids. To admit who he is and what he's done is to strip himself of even that so he lies. That's a pretty compelling read of that. I'm not sure where the truth lies. I'd be curious to hear what you thought or think having seen that film. But for me, as brilliant, and there are numerous other examples for both Leonardo and De Niro that I could cite as further piling evidence of their genius as actors. You'll know that from having seen the film. But for me, the beating heart of this film, the heart and soul of the film, the um, the presence whose understated genius and emotional resonance is the only reason I think this works is because of the portrayal of Molly Burkhart by Lily Gladstone. I think Lily Gladstone... I, let me just list a few of the things that Molly is not in a film like this, okay? She's, she's not a Native American in air quotes. She's not a patsy. She's not a hysteric. She's not a manipulator. Um, you feel for her instinctively, immediately. She carries herself with a reserve and a dignity that we then see in so many brilliantly staged scenes, the type of humiliation that these people were forced to endure, particularly the women who have to have male, white, um, I don't remember the term they use. It's not sponsors, but it's like, you have to have a white male man to be responsible for you because you are incompetent to manage your own financial affairs and your own money that you own because this is your land that the oil was discovered on is managed by these white men in a system that completely, you know, uh, exists only for the benefit of the white men who set this system up. And you see her in these scenes have to retain and restrain her sense of exactly what's going on and playing along while not losing her dignity. Um, you see scenes about her family with her mother and her sisters. You have a wonderful scene with the sisters gossiping in their native language about the men that populate their lives, the white men that populate their lives. That's a really important scene for so many reasons, not least of which is because we're seeing them as real people. And we're seeing their awareness of, uh, I think one of the sisters says, he wants money. You know, they all want money. And one of the other sisters says, well, his uncle already has money. I think he loves you, Molly. And Scorsese talks a lot about hearing this from her relatives. I think he talks about one relative who's still alive saying to him, just remember, for all these terrible things that happened, they loved each other. And, and that is one of the most impressive things about this film. And one of the most impressive things about Leo and Lily Gladstone's performance is we never really feel very far away from that reality for these two people. And to hold these two contrary things in at the same time, that he can love her and yet also do these incredibly horrid things, which result in terrible, terrible deaths and consequences, destroying her family. A lesser film would make less of that. It would choose a lane and stay in it. It would play by more trite, corny, sloppy, lazy shorthand. But this film does both. It shows that they can love each other and that he can do these things to her. 
that she can love him and be totally aware, but ignore it, but love him. These things strike me as incredibly truthful and real. And it requires not only the framework of the script and the filmmaking, but it requires the trust that that Marty clearly has in these actors to allow these things. And again, these are not all spelled out in pretty words. This is not word salad. She doesn't have a speech. I love you, Ernest, even though I know, like that's what a lesser movie would do, but it doesn't do that. It's shown, not said often. And I think that her performance is... Uh, I keep trying to reference this thing. There's this amazing sequence when her mother who is ill um, is cantankerously ill and she doesn't want Molly. She wants Anna. She wants the messy, fucked up, doomed sister, the drunk sister who carries a pistol in her pocketbook. She doesn't want Molly. And there's another sequence later where Anna, on the last night of her life, is cuddling with the sick mother and the mother basically tells her, you're my favorite. And... You feel that in Molly. You feel that Molly has to carry that presence. She's different than the other way the other sisters are portrayed. This is true to life. You know, they're not all just carbon copy versions of sisters. They each have a distinct personality. And her personality is severe at times, but there's a warmth that breaks through, most accurately represented by this clip where... Ernest is driving her, given that the Osage are so wealthy, uh, they have white servants, they have white cab drivers, like the, the script is flipped in this small town, right? It's the whites who perform the medial and subservient jobs, and it's the Osage who are the beneficiaries of this work. And so he's driving her, and her stoic and kind of... Um, unsmiling demeanor is something he's trying to puncture here. He told me he was, he was going with Matt Williams for a time. You talk too much. Oh, no, I don't talk too much. Just thinking, well, I got to beat in this horse race, that's all. I didn't realize this was a race. I don't care for watching horses. Now, she's giving him so many sly side looks here with her eyes, which when you watch the film again, keep an eye out for those. Well, I'm a different kind of horse. <laughs> what was that? That's how you are. I don't know what she said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> and right there she beams this incredible smile and has this, she has one of those great cinematic laughs. You know, I think the great movie laughs always are kind of unexpected and have a humorous ringing quality to them. You think of Eddie Murphy's laugh. That, that scene is so great because it shows the stoicism that she has, but it also shows that there's more going on there. And Lily Gladstone is absolutely going to win and should win the Academy Award for this performance. She's incredible. And she has to be incredible. Quietly, the whole weight of the entire movie is on her shoulders. And it's tough to have a role where you have to lose two sisters and a baby. And still, if you're, if you're committed to the truth of what would happen to a person to whom these things happened, how do you not just turn in this vacant-eyed shell of a human being who is so destroyed by everything, yet she retains at the very end her strength, her dignity, and her decency alone. She is not ruined by the events of this film. And I think it is just a truly incredible performance which breaks the mold of many of the tropes and the characteristics that films like this have traditionally had and availed themselves of. So your, your primary cast members, De Niro, Leonardo, Lily Gladstone, those three performances are incredible. 
but they are matched by a supporting cast of so many wonderful actors that I can't even really name all of them, but uh, Jesse Plemons as Tom White, the FBI agent, Tantu Cardinal as Lizzie, the mother of Molly and the sisters, John Lithgow, Brendan Fraser, <laughs> I want to mention, because in the limited time this film's been out, only, of course, three or four days now, this is another moment that I saw Twitter having. Again, not that that's a real moment. But I saw a lot of people freaked out by Brendan Fraser's appearance in this movie. And by appearance, I mean his physical appearance. I've seen the whale jokes. I think he's brilliant. I think he's great. I think he is another color on the palette here. Another emotional temperament of a sort we don't see elsewhere in the film. And I think if you look at a film and you look at all the cast members who have speaking parts in a film, and you're a filmmaker who has a vision such as Scorsese, Eric Roth, DiCaprio, three protagonists shaping this narrative and how we're going to experience it on screen, I think it's an incredibly smart choice to have a different emotional temperature represented by an actor like Brendan Fraser when he shows up late in the film. A lot of people seem thrown by that. I'm not sure if that's going to become more of a thing. Henry Roan is one of the most beautiful and heartbreaking characters in the film. He's played by William Bellew, uh, who's just got an incredible face. And he is this kind of doomed character who, oh, he's so good. I mean, he, he he underplays so many wonderful scenes with Molly, with whom he has this history that we find out about that she kept from Ernest, which is to her credit, I think. I love that. And there's an amazing scene where De Niro says, well, great. She's got her secrets. That means you can have yours. For him, everything's a transaction. Every emotional reality is transactional. And there are all these, these musicians who are cast. Of course, Scorsese's kind of other thing that he mostly spends time doing when he's not making uh, scripted feature films is he's made a lot of great music documentaries over the years. And so you have musicians like Sturgill Simpson, Jason Isbell, Charlie Musselwhite, Pete Yorn, and Jack White all have roles in this film. And they're quite good. You know, Jason Isbell has to really act here. He can't just be a presence on screen. Uh, all of these people have moments where they have to deliver as actors, and they do. Uh, Ellen Lewis, I mentioned her name many times on the podcast as a casting director of note. She is responsible for casting this film along with a colleague of hers who's also mentioned whose, whose name, I wanted to mention her name as well, Renee Haynes, who seems to have a specialty in casting Westerns and films that take place in and around Native communities, perhaps. Because uh, when I look at her IMDb credits, there's a lot of Western and other films there. It's edited, as I said, by Thelma Schoonmaker, who's just obviously an iconic legend. You know, so many great cast members. Um, Scott Shepard playing Byron, who's Ernest's younger brother. He's always great. Lewis can sell me as Kelsey Morrison, who I mentioned. Uh, Tommy Schultz is Blackie Thompson. Gary Basaraba plays a private investigator who gets offed in the film. He's great. I did a commercial with him once. I directed him once. Um, Barry Corbin. There's just so many great, 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 kind of supporting cast members. Everyone is of a piece here and feels so particularly pointedly in the right place in being in this film. And the other person I have to mention is Jesse Plemons, who this is not a story where at one point in his life, he was cast to be this lead in a Martin Scorsese film and then had that taken away and then had his role reduced because luckily for Jesse Plemons, that wasn't the case because Leonardo DiCaprio was cast as Tom White up to the point where in the pandemic, they realize they kind of have to have a different approach here and not have Leo play the Tom White character that Leo is going to play 
the Ernest character. And at that point is when Jesse Plemons was specifically cast to play the now reduced Tom White part. And Jesse Plemons is such an incredible actor that, you know, you have to think, again, this movie can can appear very simply constructed and presented at times. But when you think about it, by the time Jesse Plemons appears, we, the audience, know so much more than he does about what's been going on. And yet, you have an emotional feeling upon seeing him that his essential decency is something you are so grateful for, hopeful for, counting on. And he manages to exude all of that. Again, it's not overwritten. It's not overstated. He embodies this. His decency is always present. And I think it was Scorsese who mentioned a detail in Grant's book that was kind of a key for him understanding Tom White's character because he's not a vindictive lawman. He's not a... Um, he's not debasing these people that he's chasing and arresting or he, whom he knows to be guilty. He treats them with respect and dignity and courtesy. And there's an anecdote that Scorsese tells about the real Tom White, which is, uh, I think there was a guy who had escaped and sort of made Tom White look foolish and Scorsese said, I was struck, you know, coming from my background that he didn't, you know, drive this guy around the corner and beat the hell out of him to teach him a lesson. Um, he didn't even say anything to the guy. He just simply like returned him to the penitentiary and understood that um, this was what he was dealing with and that his own emotions and personal feelings didn't come into it in a way. There are so many great Plemons scenes in the film. This is the one where he first meets Ernest. Oh, I was uh, sent down from Washington, D.C. to see about these murders. Huh. Let's see. Let's see what about him? Let's see who's doing it. Hmm. You a detective? You a Pinkerton? What are you? No, sir. I was a Texas Ranger. I'm now at the federal government. It's called the Bureau of Investigation. Um... I tell you what, if you if you got questions, if you got questions, uh, I'll go talk to the sheriff. He can probably tell you what you need to know. Oh, yes, sir, I have. I, I, I talked to him, but I'm here to speak with Molly Burkhardt, who's, who's sisters and mother is dead. Yeah, Molly, yeah, no, she's, she's, my, she's my wife. <laughs> Could anyone be more guilty more immediately than Ernest oh. Burkhardt in that scene? And could Jesse Plemons know that and yet remain so open to the pleasantries of the conversation at the same time? He is an extraordinary presence in the film. The, the film is all the better for him being in it. And he is absolutely perfectly cast. So I'll probably end up having more to say about this film. I was a little, I'm still a little unresolved about releasing it so soon. It'll be coming out, I believe this Thursday. I was going to be releasing my episode on the Friends of Eddie Coyle, um, which is more to the sweet spot of the podcast's most diehard fans in its mid-70s, gritty, uh, new Hollywood cinema aspects. But we have to embrace these moments when we're captivated by films because in the world we're living in right now, it happens more and more infrequently. 
you know, the experience of going and really seeing something truly special, truly forever, it's very, very rare. And I think when it happens, we've got to embrace it. It's what gets me excited about going to the movies, the experience of, of watching a film like this. You know, a lot has been made of the running time of recent Scorsese films, The Irishman, this one. These are both three hours and 26 minutes for, for this one. The Irishman is probably something similar. It's a long time, but I would have pleasantly continued to watch the film go on for another three hours and 26 minutes. I would have pleasantly been there for a three film series that viewed this Rashomon style once entirely from the perspective of the Osage people, once entirely from the perspective of the Hales, and once entirely from the perspective of the investigation. That, that to me is the sign of a film. Even though it's long, you wish you could continue to live in the world that the film sets up. That's for me why I go so many times. That's why I've seen, that's why I went to see Blade Runner seven times in the theater. I had to have that experience as many times as I could have it while it was in a theater. Because once it's out of the theater, aside from re release, and we will have re release around the Academy Awards and other times, but you know, it's difficult to go see these movies until they have some sort of anniversary. And not every film is going to have that. A film as great as Blade Runner 2049 didn't really, didn't really have the moment it deserved. It will have it. It will be regarded as among the greatest films ever made. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, I think, is off to one of those word of mouth openings that is going to benefit the film as more more people go to see it. But let's see what happens. It's still in a moment of being embraced, and we still haven't had any kind of backlash moments yet, which I'm, sh I'm sure will be coming because it's 2023. But I can't wait to see it again. I'm going to see it again. As difficult as it is at times to experience the emotions that this film so expertly evokes in me as an audience member, I'm also aware that it's important to have those moments. It's important to be inspired to read further into this and other examples of our shared history and collective complicity in order to have an understanding that is not wholly shaped by things like the 1959 version of the story or other rote mechanical, by the book, by the numbers, white savior uh, lenses that things get viewed through in our society all too often. So I hope you enjoyed Killers of the Flower Moon. I think if you're a fan of the podcast, I actually know several people who, um, who have worked on the film through the podcast. I'm not going to mention them here. But there are a few people who follow the pod who worked on the film, and I'm very curious, particularly uh, for them to hear, uh, I'm curious to hear from them what their experience of going to see the film is. I know one in particular was, was I believe, on location for, it could be eight months or eight months of this person's working career was spent fully immersed in this world. And he, he mentioned he's going to go see the movie tomorrow, Tuesday. I'm recording this on Monday the 23rd. What's it like to sit in a theater and watch something like that when you've, you've been on the set when the cameras weren't rolling, which can look, which can look and feel weird, by the way. <laughs> if, you, if you are behind the scenes or on a film set and you're watching things happen, it's like you almost can't hear the dialogue. You, you don't know what's taking place all the time. So I think it will be very interesting to hear what those people experience from seeing this film. And I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed this episode. And I thank you as ever for listening to the Full Cast and Crew podcast. And I will be back soon with another episode.